Professor Beckert. Thank you so much, Joanne, and to all of our attendees, welcome to the inaugural convening of the Pitch for Change speaker series. And I'm very much honored to have the opportunity to launch this journey today with you. A tremendous amount of commitment, as you can imagine, has gone towards bringing this moment together. And I would like to recognize the dedicated members of our advisory councils, as well as the leadership team, especially Joanne Pasternak and Steve Ortega, who have been instrumental in ensuring that we could gather today at this pivotal moment in our history. As you know, athletes and activism have been connected since the earliest sporting events, long before Moses Fleetwood Walker took the field on May 1st, 1894, as the first African-American Major League Baseball player. Athlete activists such as Getrude Ederle, Muhammad Ali, Jean King, Jim Brown, Loretta Claiborne, Melissa Stockwell, Eric Reed, LeBron James, and of course, Colin Kaepernick, all have taken a stand for issues of local, national, and global relevance. But it is safe to say that never before has athlete activism been as prevalent as it is today. We're here to consider this history, to encourage us to think about its present moment and perhaps also in some ways to look into the future and the possibilities that they are in that future. Such a conversation is at the core of what we hope to accomplish with Athletes Voices, a program that is an exciting new initiative of the Global Sports Initiative at the Weatherhead Initiative for Global History at Harvard. We seek to enter a conversation with athletes on some of the most important topics of today and to jointly think about how we got here where we are now, and perhaps also where we might be going next. In recent years, issues such as racism, the long-term legacy of slavery, gender discrimination, and poverty are issues raised to great effect by many athletes in the United States and abroad. And when we want to connect to these debates and bring our academic expertise into these discussions. Today's conversation sets the stage for the convenings to come over the next nine months as we advance towards welcoming a cohort of elite professionals and Olympic caliber athletes for the inaugural convening of the Athletes Voices three-day program in June of 2021. Today is the start of that journey and we are thrilled to have you joining us for this exciting launch event. Our panel today will be moderated by veteran philanthropic executive Carol Stern. Carol has over 25, over 30 years in the- I can say 25. <laughs> over 30 years, it's true. Over 30 years of experience in the nonprofit sector as a child advocate and as a civil rights activist. She's co currently the executive director of the Ward and Family Foundation, but prior to joining the foundation, she served for 12 years as the president and CEO of UNICEF USA and was the chief operating officer and senior associate national director of the Anti-Defamation League. A noted author, speaker, strategist, and leader, she has worked extensively with athletes to support their efforts to raise awareness and impact change around humanitarian crises globally. Sharon. Thank you so much, Ben. I am really excited to be joining this panel today and to have the opportunity to talk to three truly outstanding men. Um, you know, I've seen the power of sports. I've seen it firsthand as a college freshman. I found my space on campus when I made the swim team. You know, as the mom of three boys and now more recently two grandchildren, I've watched the, how the psychosocial development of them has grown through sport. I've watched team skills develop. I've watched leadership skills come out. But as my role mostly at UNICEF USA showed me the power of the voices of athletes. You know, I saw it time and time again that when an athlete spoke, the world listened. And perhaps the, the first time I really noted that was Immediately following the Haiti earthquake, we were really out there trying to get Americans to support the country of Haiti. And I had the privilege to be part of a Czech presentation on court at a Sixers game when Sammy Dallenberg spoke to the crowd and said, please help my country and handed me a check. 
ESPN put that on the front page of their site. And that night we raised more money for the earthquake than any other night in the entire campaign. So I saw firsthand what it means when an athlete speaks and fans listen. So I have in the ensuing years turned to athletes for help on an ongoing basis. Some of the faces you see before you I've traveled with, I've had the privilege to be part of programs with, traveling to Africa with the NBA for Basketball Without Borders, working with MLS as they built their foundation, taking meetings with FIFA, with the NFL, with umpteen different athletes to see the power of their podiums as drivers of social impact and how they can compel their, pan their fans to follow that as well. So today, we're gonna hear from three of them. We're gonna hear from three people who, who share that love of the game, who also share the legacy of sport, and who understand the power of the podium they've each been given in their role associated with athletes. So let me introduce all three real briefly, and then we're gonna get started. First up will be Donald Lassier. He's the president and CEO of the Muhammad Ali Center in Louisville, Kentucky. The center is dedicated to the great late athlete Muhammad Ali's life and legacy. You know, it, it focuses on education, on citizenship, on gender equity, the center encourages young people to become actively involved in social justice issues. And Donald holds an MBA from Harvard, from the B School, and also a JD from Georgetown, as well as a BA from the University of San Francisco. Also joining us, Pau Gasol. Most people know him as a two-time NBA champ, a six-time NBA All-Star, NBA Rookie of the Year, representing his home country of Spain. They know him as a three-time Olympic medalist, a FIBA world champion, MVP, a player of the year. I know him as a UNICEF ambassador. I know him as a guy I'd turn to when I really wanted the world to listen. I know him as a guy with a really big heart. He's also a brand new dad. We'll, we'll share that now too. We made him show pictures just before we went on. He's the co-founder of the Gasol Foundation. He's the global champion for nutrition and zero childhood obesity for UNICEF. He's the real deal. He's a true champion for children. And another true champion here with us, Tori Smith. He's a two-time Super Bowl champ who played eight seasons in the NFL. He's been nominated for the league's highest philanthropic honor, the Walton Payton Man of the Year Award three times. And working with his wife, Chanel, Tori's charitable foundation focuses on providing support to at youth risk with all kinds of challenges, challenges such as physical, financial, educational. And he also provides amazing assistance to those affected by domestic violence. And his life story, Tori, your story, I think is an inspiration. I know it's an inspiration for your voice, but I think your life story is an inspiration for all of us. So let's start with Donald. Donald, why don't you share a little historical perspective you know, around Muhammad Ali's journey, you know, his vision, his guiding principles, legacy, and, and touch on his willingness, if you would, to take risks. I think that's an important message. Hey, Carol, definitely. First, I want to say what an honor it is to be on this panel and to be with distinguished panelists that are here with us. So from a historical perspective, and I'm glad you asked that, because what people really need to understand about Muhammad is that he started out here in Louisville, Kentucky, which remains one of the most segregated cities in the country. He grew up on what's called West Louisville. Here in Louisville, we have what's called the Ninth Street Divide, which in the past meant most white people wouldn't cross that line. So when I say he grew up in segregation, it was serious segregation. When he was 12 years old, he had a red swim bike, a new bike that was stolen. And when his bike was stolen, he went to the police and he met an officer named Joe Martin, and he told Joe Martin that he was going to whoop the thief that stole his bike. Now, knowing Muhammad, as you know, Muhammad, this wouldn't surprise you. He was asked, do you know how to fight? At the time, his name was Cassius Clay. And he said, no, but I'm going to whoop the thief anyway. That he exhibited confidence at a very early age. So the rest is history. He did enter Joe Martin's boxing program became an Olympic champion in 1960, came back to Louisville, went to an area of town that wasn't frequented by black people and was denied service in a restaurant simply because he was black. He was 18 years old. 
And as the legend goes, he threw his Olympic medal off one of the bridges here because he, you know, felt the country did not support him as a black person. That sort of started his journey because I get asked this question all the time. How did he become a Muslim? And while it's fuzzy, one story that really sticks out is that he saw a cartoon on the back of a newspaper by the Nation of Islam called Muhammad Speaks. And that cartoon was a white slave master beating a black man, but the black man was, play, was praying to Allah. And the slave owner said, get that infidel religion out of here. You have to pray to Jesus. What made that important is that was true. That stuff really did happen. Because what a lot of people don't know is that upwards of 20% of the slaves that were brought to this country were Muslims. Muhammad was really a student of history and he knew that. And so he changed his name, he converted to Islam, he became Muhammad Ali. And when he became Muhammad Ali, of course, because he was world heavyweight champion, the world reacted in a very, very negative way. He was not viewed as a global icon, even though he was heavyweight champion. He was basically viewed as a pariah, particularly by the media, by the powers that be in this country. And so after having several fights, in 1966, he was inducted into the armed forces and he refused that. Now here's an interesting part about that journey and that story. He originally took whatever test they had back then to determine your draft status. And he was classified, as the army said, too dumb to be drafted. And as Muhammad said, he never said he was smart, he, but they reclassified him. And for some reason, he was now draft eligible. 1966 in Houston, he said, I'm not going. And of course that activated a firestorm of media and what have you. And he really did believe that he was doing the right thing for the right reason, which was his faith in Islam. This really ticks us off when people at the center ask us, why was he a draft dodger? He was not a draft dodger. One of the points that I really want to make about Muhammad is that he had the conviction to stand up for his beliefs. And more importantly, he had the conviction to accept the consequences. You asked about what he was willing to give up. Well, let's think about it. He was 25 years old in his prime as a boxer, 25 years old, when he burst onto this scene as a conscientious objector. And he was willing to give up his career as a heavyweight champion, something that he had wished for, for since he was 12 years old, actually. He gave that up and stood by those convictions. And fortunately, the winds of change were happening with regard to the Vietnam War. So one of the things that athletes should know is that timing meeting opportunity is very important and you need to take advantage of that because Muhammad did that very, very well. I wanna tell this story because it really crystallizes what he was about with regard to his faith. Some of you all may be familiar with what's called the Cleveland Summit. And that was when a bunch of athletes came together in 1967. Now, the true story behind that is they didn't necessarily come and meet with Muhammad to see if he was really behind his objection they actually came because they were gonna be able to make some money because if they could convince Muhammad to go and do exhibition matches while being in the armed forces, they would get the cable rights. And so some of the athletes involved in that are, you know, household names, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was a little sender at the time, he was a senior at UCLA, Jim Brown, somebody that Tori may know, John Wooten, who's very much responsible for the Rooney Rule. Very nice man, by the way. Anyhow, they could not convince him to do anything except what he was doing, which was standing by his faith. They tried, I think the meeting lasted for four hours and we're talking some very convincing people. If you ever met Jim Brown, you will know what I'm talking about. Very convincing man. Muhammad stood by his conviction, 
which is one of his core principles, by the way. And he did not change off his stance. He stayed true to his beliefs. And from then on, what happened is he changed the minds of some of those athletes in the room. And they put their um, careers somewhat on the line by standing behind him and saying, we're gonna stand up for his beliefs. One of the statistics I wanna talk about is when he made that conscientious objection, the majority of the country still supported the Vietnam War. By the time he was done four and a half years later, 66% of the country now opposed the war. And a lot of it had to do with the celebrity of Muhammad Ali. And that celebrity is very important. Carol, you mentioned that athletes have a platform. Muhammad used that platform to change minds and to unite people because there was a divide in terms of how people were going to be activists against the war. And he sort of united people for that singular cause, right? And that's what he tried to do when you talk about vision. That's what he wanted to do with the rest of his life. Muhammad wanted to unite people of all faiths, of all religions, of all creeds, to love one another and to respect one another. Respect is another one of his core principles. And so he carried that throughout the rest of his life, which was extremely important. So now here at the Muhammad Ali Center, that's what we're trying to do, carry on his legacy by supporting racial justice, by supporting gender equality, by supporting education, by supporting global citizenship. As you all know, Louisville right now is one of the epicenters of this racial ju justice awakening in this country because of Breonna Taylor. And so one of the things that the center is doing on behalf of Muhammad's legacy is speaking out for race, racial justice in a very, very big, bold way because Muhammad was big and bold. So we always try to come back to that point actually in a moment. So, Absolutely. Yeah. so as with most cities, our city, our downtown is boarded up. So one of the things the center did is we took the boards from some of the companies downtown and created an exhibit called Truth Be Told. And what Truth Be Told is it articulates many of the policies from slavery to 2020 that have impacted Black lives here in America. And when you put this all together, there is no doubt when you read the panels that there is systemic racism in this country. And one of the reasons we did that is because there are still many, many people that don't believe that systemic racism exists because they say, somebody would have to be pulling the levers for it to exist. But when we show the policies that go from the federal government, state governments, local governments that have created a system of racism, it's mind boggling. And it's loud like Muhammad would be, and it's bold like Muhammad would be. We also have a series on racial justice. And we have an event coming up that basically deals with anti-racism and basically says that if you are silent, then you are not being anti-racist. You have to speak out against racism. And that again is something that Muhammad really preached in terms of making sure people's voices are heard. The most important thing that I found when I met Muhammad, when I got to hang out with him is that he, while he was this big person, this big personality, he always talked to one person and that was you when you were with him. He blocked out everything else and he made you feel like you were the most important person in the, in the room. And that's magic. And athletes who can do that and have that ability to create that type of magic seriously can change the world. And with that- Let me that, just stop you there for one sec and I'm gonna, Come back to you, I promise. Let me turn to Pau, because I actually know the magic you speak of. I've watched what happens when Pau's out in the field with kids. Um, why don't you, you know, take us through a little bit, Pau, of how you came to 
be engaged with what you're doing, the foundation, UNICEF, a little bit about your journey as well. Well, thank you, Carol. And, and th a pleasure and an honor also to be a part of this panel and, uh, and to speak out about my, my experience. And I, and I think the importance of the role of sports and athletes, especially in, in moments as we're going through right now. Um, I think for, first and foremost, I would have to attribute it to my upbringing and my parents. Um, my mom and my dad uh, instilled my, the core values that I have and that I carry throughout my, my life. They're both in the medical field. My mom is a, is a doctor, my dad is a registered nurse. So they always cared for, for people and they uh, provided treatment and, and care for people. Um, so that was something that I was inspired by and touched by. And uh, I wanted myself to become a doctor until basketball kind of got in the way. Um, and I started realizing that, well, maybe it is also this, let me give this a shot. Um, but um, that's kind of where my, my um, spirit and my instinct uh, of helping and giving back and, and helping less fortunate started and helping anyone that needed help really. And once I started playing basketball and I started having success, uh, some recognition, um, people's appreciation and following, I, I, I started to, under, to understand I have to channel this for, for a greater cause, for a greater good. Uh, there's a lot of people, most people don't have the, the, the opportunities that I've got throughout my life. A lot of people don't have the, the fortune that I have to, to, to be able to do what they love, to be able to be, you know, to be healthy, to grow up in a, in a home with both parents present, with the education that I received. Um, so let, let me explore how I can give back and utilize my platform and my, my success. Um, and, uh, and that's when I started having conversations also with, with UNICEF uh, early in 2003, early in my career. I started, I became also an ambassador for St. Jude in Memphis because I played my first six and a half years of my career there. And I continue to be an ambassador for, for the hospital uh, until recently. Um, and I worked with so many pediatric hospitals and until the point that I also created our own foundation. Um, but, um, you know, the work that we've done and things that I've been able to see, uh, it's just been life changing for me. Uh, I've been always so humbled um, to, uh, to, be, to have the opportunities to, to just to give back, to make a difference, to uh, make those kids smiles. Uh, it's my, and, and also I've been able to see the power, as you said earlier, uh, the power of sport, you know, um, by I think understanding and I think a point of emphasis here is also, you know, athletes need to, and I, I think they understand more and more now the power of and the need to educate themselves in order to speak out and to say the right things, always from the heart. You know, I think that's also very important. It has to come from the heart. It can be fake. It can be scripted. Uh, you have to really feel it. And I think that's when really, when it really makes a difference, when it really gets through, it penetrates those walls. So, uh, you know, we, we, I've seen when my, my trips to Ethiopia, to South Africa, to Chad, uh, to Angola, the power of, of sports. And at the end of the day, kids, they love to play. You know, they love sports. And I've seen how after civil wars, uh, children from different tribes play together and they come together because of basketball, because of sports, because of soccer. Because uh, uh, those, those are usually the sports that are more, mostly played or, or, or known in, uh, in Africa that I've seen. Uh, how uh, child soldiers, the programs that UNICEF have with child soldier, soldiers, how therapeutical it is to, uh, to play sports and to make them feel like children again after going through, through such a huge trauma. Um, so I, I've seen it, I've lived it, I believe in it. Um, and, and that's why I'm just always so open and, and proud to just to do my part, to add my portion of help um, into whatever, whatever is needed uh, and the importance of doing it together. Uh, no matter how big you are, how important you are, I think as, 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 as um, Donald was saying with the summit in Cleveland and Mohammed is one of the huge icons of, of utilizing your, your platform, sacrificing yourself for the better and greater good, um, sacrificing your career. That's when 
you know, things really are real and people re really believe in you, right? And, and, and he changed minds of other athletes that all they were thinking potentially at that time is to, to thrive, right? To, to move up, to achieve, uh, to follow that competitive uh, edge that athletes uh, have. Um, and, and being able to understand and, and making them see how, oh, how uh, the impact that they could have, right? And, and, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar at the time, Louis Alcindor, he refused to go to the, uh, the, the, the Mexico Olympic Games in, in 68. And, you know, the, the impact that he had probably on Bill Russell and Jim Brown. And, 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 and that's, that's, just, that's just so invaluable. So we need to have that type of mindset uh, because in a moment that it's so, so much needed. So thank you so much for having me. And, and thank you, Carol, for your kind words. I love you and, and you're an amazing inspiration. Thank you. So Tori, thank you. So Tori, you know, um, I'm a fan from afar. <laughs> so excited to have this opportunity to talk to you. And, you know, your path to advocacy is, is somewhat different. And, um, you know, I, I I know that you have the same commitment that Muhammad Ali to Pakistan bring to this and for very different reasons. So why don't you share a little bit about the causes you're, you're committed to and, and perhaps a bit about why. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you, appreciate y'all for having me and you know, hearing the story about Muhammad Ali gave me goosebumps over here because I had the opportunity to meet him you know, with the Baltimore Ravens and that's still one of the best days of my life because he is one of my biggest inspirations simply because of his actions, you know, um, just watching him, I, I was like starstruck. I was shocked. You know, he's like, he's a hero, a living hero uh, to me. So that was huge. And uh, he fought and stood up and spoke for people like me. And for me, it means the world being in this position now uh, to be able to, I've always kind of really been that person since I would say middle school. <laughs> you know, I've been very vocal about things that I recognize as wrong. And I feel like everyone has that same ability, you know, whether you're a little old middle school me, you know, at Gale Middle School in Virginia, or uh, you're a star NBA player or a football player, or a soccer player. So to me, it just always meant the world to lend your helping hand out to others in need and your voice, because sometimes that's all it takes. And so that's how it was for me, because I wouldn't be right here on this panel if it was more people believing in me, uh, giving me hope, fighting for me. And, you know, simp we underestimate our ability and our influence by leading by example, um, giving people hope, which is something that you can't measure with a paycheck. Um, you can't measure with your dollar. It's all about your time and giving that to individuals. So I try to give my time as much as I can to help people uh, to show that they do matter, that they are loved, that you know we do value them, but also trying to fight against policies that I know impact people disproportionately or negatively or have a negative effect on families or individuals. And, you know, I'm all over the place. From the way I came up, my involvement with my family in the criminal justice system has always been a passion of mine. So if I wasn't an athlete, I would have been a lawyer, graduated from Maryland with a criminal justice degree. Um, and then when it comes to uh, just understanding government and how America works, I had the opportunity to intern with Elijah Cummings one month after we won the Super Bowl when I was in Baltimore. So that was pretty special to me too, just to try to learn, you know, because we're literally in an election cycle right now and everyone's talking about vote, vote, vote. Well, I was always told vote, your, your vote matters and all of that. And then after that, you go silent. So for me, I wanted to know, hey, what are they really doing? Like I'm voting for you, what are you actually doing? And so I just continue to educate myself along this journey, but to always be a voice and speak up, you know, for the voiceless and literally voiceless meaning <laughs> animals as well. So I, I try to help any and everyone uh, that's in need because it's my responsibility to do so. Wow, terrific answers, all three of you. Well, you know, each of you touched on a legacy of someone. You know, you each mentioned some of the people that influenced you. Think for a moment, without renaming the names we've already named, you know, think of the athletes. Who else would you point to and say, wow, this is a person who's made a difference. This is the person who's using their voice in a way I would hope to. Who comes to mind for you? And I open that to all three of you. So whoever wants to go first. I think present day for me is LeBron James. You know, obviously he's one of the biggest stars in the world, but I think half the battle as an athlete is understanding the value that you have and your influence. And the other half is actually being bold enough to stand on something and to fight for people. 
So to watch what he's been able to do, um, his influence abroad, but really, I mean, he has a, a charter school, you know, in the area where he's from. I think that's special. It points to education, which uh, there's a major difference in different cities and towns all across the country. And obviously he speaks up for social justice initiatives as well. But I think just, you know, part of that is just being bold, being comfortable. You know, I think it helps when you're the biggest star in the world, but just because you're, you know, a big star doesn't mean you're bold enough to do it because some people are concerned about their dollar or what people may think about them. So I think the present day athlete, you know, it has to be LeBron James in my opinion. If I can. Donald, go ahead, Donald. So I'm gonna sort of share my bias having gone to University of San Francisco. I wanna <laughs> say the Golden State Warriors, particularly Steve Kerr. The way I found out about George Floyd is from Steve Kerr when he said, first person I heard say this, that was murder. And when you hear him speak about social justice, he's very serious. And also, while on a much more understated way, the leader of the Golden State Warrior, Steph Curry, I admire the way he goes about talking about social justice issues and now becoming involved in politics. And more importantly, he puts his family out there as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's extremely important because when you, as a father, as a parent, are demonstrating that type of leadership in front of your kids, that translates globally. And so I'd have to give it to the Golden State Warriors and what they're doing. Al? So to, to me, someone that has touched my life and has inspired me also to, I guess to have certain certain attitude and approach that I have is Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. uh, to me that he, he was able to change the you know the history and the, and the reality and apartheid and apartheid in South Africa, um, and he used sports that World Championship Rugby World Championship of '94. He used sports to bring the country together. I mean that story uh, and how he handled getting out of jail after being incarcerated for 27 years, and uh, after and then becoming president and uh, not holding grudges. Uh, but making allies with his oppressors and his approach. I mean, his demeanor is just, to me, he's one of the all time greatest human beings. Uh, and it's, he's so inspiring. And I've learned so much from him by reading autobiographies or reading books about him, how he walked early in the morning, how he prepared for every meeting that he had uh, before he met with whoever it was. So he knew the person that he was meeting, uh, how he had that, connection that we were talking about that he could make you feel like the most important person in the room um you know he had that charisma uh to change to change the world and and he really did and he really inspired and yes there are others but we can learn so much from people that have done it in a way that has been just exceptional and so inspiring and he's inspired me uh, so much through my life and that's why I want to continue to make the biggest possible impact that I have and that's why I also always remember um, Jackie Robinson's quote on his epitaph uh, you know that life should be measured by the impact that we have on others um, and that's that's as, as rich or as poor as your life will be you know how many impacts how many lives have you impacted in, in your journey and we don't know when that journey is going to end you can at any point so let's just make the biggest and most positive impact that we can have love watching all three heads nodding on that one. <laughs> it was just Ouch. perfect. Thank you, gentlemen. That was, I think, all three answers. So, you know, I, I would concur really outstanding examples of what we all can do and could be. Let me move us a little bit away from that and talk about what's going on in the world right now. You know, you are three people who give back and give back in very big ways and in very impactful ways. And it's been a tough year for all of us. So what's, what are you doing right now that's giving you hope? Huh? Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, well, what I've been trying to do is just trying to be proactive. I think that's all we can do. We can't just sit and watch. We got to be proactive. We got to inform ourselves. We got to create uh, alliances. We got to reach out to people. What can we do, right? And that's from early in the pandemic. Uh, well, what I try to do with uh, other top athletes in, in, in Spain, 
it was uh, we raised a campaign. We actually did it with the Red Cross, with uh, and it was just out of a conversation with Rafa Nadal, the tennis player. Uh, and, and we just say, hey, we got to do something. Our country is suffering. We're losing a lot of people. Uh, we're, we're, we, can't, we can't just sit and, and watch this. So, so we put out a campaign with the Red Cross and, and put out a challenge and a call to action to raise over a million, no, over 11 million euros uh, to help over 1,300 people. Um, and we, were, we actually hit 15 million euros just by, by launching, putting a video out and just say, hey, let's just come together. You know, we, we, it was a call to action to all athletes, all clubs, all sports across Spain. And then artists joined in, other, other people joined in and they wanted to be a part of it, all the league joined in. And uh, so that's something that gave me a lot of encouragement and showed me once again, the power of teamwork, the power of sports, coming together, making a real impact and a real difference. On the other end, I've been doing also summits. I've been doing like uh, health summits. I've been doing Instagram lives with people talking about different issues, uh, and mainly the pandemic and, and COVID-19. I've been talking to you know, other leaders, uh, uh, Dr. Harry Edwards, uh, Coach George Raveling. I've been talking and, and learning and listening and say, what can I do? How can I help? You know, um, I've been having conversations again with, with multiple people just so I, I feel like I'm doing everything that I can. Uh, as, as you said, as now I have a three week old daughter and, and that's taking quite a bit of my time. And that's given me a lot of life and hope and, and brightness during these times as well. Um, but, you know, all I can say is, is just just be proactive, reach out. There's, a, there's just a lot of opportunities, a lot of people that want to do good, but they don't know exactly which direction to take or go to. And I think that that's why I also love the athletes' voices and this opportunity to be with all of you and, and to, to figure that out, you know, to come together and to, um, and to inspire others to do the same. Corey, how about you? What's giving you hope right now? I mean, to me, to use a sports analogy, when it's the fourth quarter and the pressure's on the line and things are going crazy, you have to perform at your best. You have to elevate and find that next level. Um, so that's really where I've been, uh, trying to learn more, trying to help more people and try to just play my role because, I mean, things have been highlighted so much. There have been people, and I've been one of them, that have been talking about things for years, and now things are so clear. And people are willing to learn. So how can we educate them? How can we be better? And COVID is a, a whole other, you know, curveball that's been thrown in there. So to me, I've just been trying to do as much as I can um, to help as many people as possible. But also, you know, even beyond that, just to remain focused. You know, don't don't put too much pressure on myself. You know, in terms of like feeling like you have to do it all by yourself. I think now people are understanding more the power of collaboration. Um, people are understanding that they are capable of doing more. So whether that's partnering with individuals or companies or corporations, um, that's been something that has been keeping me busy lately, just learning how to maximize you know, the community because my focus prim is primarily here in America, uh, specifically in Baltimore City. Uh, but so for me, you know, again, I'm just trying to help people right now because it's urgent and it always has been urgent. But now, you know, you have to take it to that next level in the fourth quarter. Thanks. Don, Donald? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, we have a series on racial justice. And to both Paul and Tori's point, people have to learn. So we're teaching. And we're really focusing on the end game. Tori mentioned earlier that it's policies that have created where we are today. And so if you educate people on the policies, and they understand how to talk about the policies, they can really articulate what it is they want to change. Yesterday, for example, we had a, a series on racial justice where educators from all over the country were able to participate and learn about some of the policies that impact them. And so if we can do what our now current call to action is, which is learn, share, and then vote, but you need to vote for the right people. And you need to understand that you have to hold those folks feet to the fire because 
to your point, Tori, if you just vote and then sit back and don't do anything, nothing's really going to happen. You are now, we're now at a point in history where we have to hold people accountable. And so that's picking people at the local level that you want to vote for, picking, picking people at the state level and the federal level. And we're trying to teach people how to do that. Great, great. As you look across the nation today, and we have all of these great young athletes coming up the pike here, what do you tell them? How do you get them to, to understand the power of their podium? If I can speak as the non-athlete on the panel, <laughs> from my perspective, they have the platform and the platform with the knowledge and the courage to speak out is a powerful thing. And so I'm so honored to be with Paul and to be with Tori because they're doing that. And if they can encourage other athletes with the platform to speak out, to speak their truth, to speak truth to power, and not be afraid to lose maybe an endorsement here or a contract here, then they're going to be the leaders that help us change the world and help us change the country for the better. And I think as a non-athlete, I look at my kids, how they look up to athletes. I think they have the perfect platform to do that. Yeah, I think what I would say, what I would add to that is whether, whether you like it or not as an athlete, you have a responsibility. Um, you have the platform and you have the power to, uh, to, to, to affect and to touch people's lives, especially young, the younger generation. So, so I think based on that, I think you're, based on that responsibility, what I would do is to, first of all, look at what other athletes are doing. You know, look at what LeBron James are doing, is doing. Look at what Colin Ka Kaepernick is doing. Look at what Steph Curry is doing. Look at what Carmelo Anthony is doing. Look at, uh, there's so many other uh, uh, athletes. Look at what they're doing. You know, maybe reach out to them. You know, if you're a young athlete, uh, don't be don't be shy. Don't don't feel awkward by hey, let me can I can I talk to you? Uh, can I hear more about what you're doing? Can I learn? Can I how can I help? You know, can I, you know, if I love what you're doing and it touches my heart and I think it's important, how can I be part of that? I think a lot of athletes, because of the ego factor, sometimes uh, they want to create their own thing. You know, this is my thing. This is not LeBron James thing. This is not Colin Kaepernick thing. This is going to be my initiative and it's going to have my name on it. You know, I think as for young athletes, I think it's important to say, you know what, it's not about me. Just as it isn't about LeBron James, really, it's it's about voting. It's about you know justice. It's about equality. Uh, it's about human rights. You know, it's about loving and respecting each other. That's what it what it's about. And who's who's doing that? Lo, well, I want to be a part of that, and I'm going to educate myself. I'm going to reach out. I'm going to understand the power that I have uh, for as long as I have it, and 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 after, you know, and and I think. I, from that, from that type of approach and attitude, a lot of incredible things can happen. And, and you can really inspire a lot of people just by doing that. All right. Yeah, I would add that I to kind of echo, you know, of how I said, I believe that every athlete is a role model, whether they want to or not, but we have to be honest, every athlete isn't interested in speaking up. Um, every athlete isn't interested in community service, just like every American citizen doesn't care about the things that we're talking about or any athlete or every any citizen in any city right in the world um they don't they aren't necessarily passionate about the issues that may even impact themselves all right um so my conversation that i have with younger guys is like hey is this issue important to you yes or no and if their answer is yes then you should speak out on it because if something can't be important to you and then you remain silent whether you know it's right or wrong. For example, they wanna get paid for their job. It's important to them. So they show up, so they do more, right? They love their families. It's important to them. So they provide for them, so they work hard. So if something is valuable to you and it's important to you, then you naturally care about it and it's your responsibility to speak up. So I just try to get them to understand that because you know, oftentimes like people are trying to, you look at a guy like Powell or, LeBron and you're like, man, I don't even know where to start. 
Well, don't be afraid to ask questions, right? Everyone wants to see people win. Um, at the end of the day, if power helps and saves a life literally by just speaking life into them, that's a huge win for everyone. And so as long as you remove your egos, I, which I thought was perfect, but too often there are egos involved um, in projects, which is why people don't collaborate as much as they should. Um, that's literally from athletes to families to corporations. <laughs> um, you know, that, that's, that's just how it goes. Um, as long as you continue to move past that, you know, as a young athlete, there's a lot of potential for them to help, you know, make it make the change that and be the change that they want to see in this world. So the next question, and before I even ask it, let me just tell our, our viewer audience in a few minutes, we're going to open it up to some questions. So if you have questions you want to ask, please, let's start getting them into the chat room so we can, I can make sure that our athletes and our guests have an opportunity to um, answer them. So I had an experience today that was about one person and the difference that was made in one person's life. And in a moment, I'm gonna ask each of you to, to tell a story of one person because very often what happens to people is we talk in large numbers about the impact we have and it's hard for people to get their arms around big, big numbers and big things as opposed to one person. And you know, at the Walton Family Foundation, we are currently engaged in a number of things. We, you know, we do K-12 education, the environment, and we also focus on our home region. And one of the things we're looking at now is how we support our nation's youth and how we make sure that they're getting the capacity building there that they need to take on the challenges that all of us are talking about right now. And through the We Are Family Foundation, a group we gave a grant to, they are empowering young people who are doing constructive social action in their community. Today, they sent me a video. It's all of about three minutes long of a young man. He's, I think, 17 years old, who's been organizing his community. And when they told him he was getting a $5,000 grant to build his organization, and he cried. He literally cried. And I watched a young man whose life got changed today. So tell me a little bit about your work. Tell me a story of someone whose life you changed. I, I want our viewers to understand the power of giving back. Um, sure, I'll start. Uh, um, man, I can think of a, a few stories. And I think at the, at the end of the day, it's all about human connections and human interactions. Uh, because at first, uh, yes, there's, and, and most of my, my trips with UNICEF, those kids never watched a basketball game. Those kids never seen an NBA game. They don't know anything. They, they just, the funny thing about me is that they, I'm over seven feet. So they see this giant, which is already pretty cool. They've probably never seen a, a guy this, as tall as I am. And, and they see someone that wants to play with them, that, that uh, wants to sit down and take time and hold their hand and, or shoot a basketball or kick a ball or whatever it might be, uh, or help them with their homework. You know, I've been in South Africa. I went to a few foster homes uh, from children that have lost their parents due to AIDS um, in 2005. So uh, I remember that and I just helped them do their homework and kids just want attention, they won't care. So uh, I have a, a lot of stories, but I've been able to, to develop some personal friendships. Uh, I, I met a kid when I played with the Lakers, his name was Ezra. He was born with a congenital disease and, uh, and he had to have his leg amputated and his arm and his hand are you know, a, a little bit deformed, uh, if you will. And and I, I met him when he was six, seven years old uh, through a, actually a TV show because um, he wanted to, to meet me and uh, it was kind of his wish. And we've had a, a great friendship and relationship through the years. And, and I've seen him grow up and I would just go and get together with him and shoot hoops. And he would get really upset when I beat him. And I'm like, uh, Ezra, uh, I'm, I'm supposed to beat you. I do this for a living. <laughs> Don't get upset. Just keep, just keep playing. Just keep, keep getting better. You're doing great. And, and he was playing basketball and he gives speeches um, to other kids uh, because, um, because it's, it's uh, just because you're different doesn't mean that you did something wrong with you and it's okay to be different and you can ex excel at anything you want, even if you have a leg amputated uh, and three toes uh, for a hand. Um, so 
he's uh, him and his family uh, is a, a relationship that I developed over the years and I still to the, to the day uh, and now his dream is to be in the Paralympic Games of Tokyo uh, so uh, so it's you know it's been an amazing to me uh, story personal story uh, and that I and that I love and it's kind of what you live for right uh, I have others uh, others that are very touching as well. I've, I've had a lot of interactions with cancer patients, uh, and I developed a relationship with the families. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of those kids don't don't end up making it. Some do, some don't. Um, but there was a, a family in Chicago, at Lures Children's Hospital, that I developed such a close relationship because every time that I would go, I would visit their daughter, and um, they wanted me to be there the day that they had to unplug her from the respirator to let her go. Uh, and, uh, and they gave me the, her blanket, uh, which she always, um, you know, had over um, at the hospital uh, and they wanted me to keep that. So to, the, to that level of impact, and those are some of the most powerful um, human experiences that I've experienced in my life and that, I, that are just incredible. I mean, just Wars cannot describe those moments. Uh, and, that, and that's why I feel so lucky and so fortunate to have that type of impact. Corey? I think to echo what Paul said, like all of them, I'm sure he can relate to this. There's so many things that you've been able to support financially where you can see change in someone's life, right? Obviously he's all over the world doing things. So your money helps, but my most valuable memory was just simply talking with the kid at school one time. So it was my rookie year. I was in Baltimore and this kid kept he was asking a bunch of questions at the school and he was following me around. I think he's getting in trouble for leaving class. He got following me around. So the teacher ended up letting him come out to come see me. I was uh, teaching at a program there. And he comes and he's like, hey, um, you know, I want to talk to you about how did you end up going to college? How did you end up doing this? And, you know, I just spent some time with them. I talked with them afterwards. And I was like, man, that was a, a curious kid. Like, that was me. You know, I would have asked a million and one questions <laughs> about ball and life. Well, last two years ago, when the Super Bowl was in Atlanta, um, well, I was on a panel with the NFL talking about social justice um, at Morehouse College. And a um, kid stays afterwards and was like, hey, you know, uh, do you remember me? I was like, no. He was like, you were at such and such elementary school and you spent some time with me afterwards and I knew exactly who he was right then and there. He was like, man, I still have your picture up, you know, on my wall in college because you were the reason when I saw you that day, it made me feel like I could go to college and I was capable of doing more. He was like, you made me believe in myself. And so to me, that meant more than any other things that we've had to do because it's like, man, that was just time it was, you show authentic love and that meant more than anything else. So to me, understanding the influence of both, right? You need money to help create an impact in a lot of spaces, but we're all capable of giving our time and showing love to someone and you just never know how far it may take them. Donald, do you want to share a story? Yes, yeah, so one of our core principles is confidence and instilling kids with confidence. And so Carol, you'll get a kick out of this. Last year, we started a USA swim team at the Muhammad Ali Center for kids in West Louisville, uh, underprivileged minority kids. And as you all may know, a black or brown teenager is four to six times more likely to drown because they don't have access to, to water and they don't have access to pools. And so there was this one young lady, her name was Harry, and she was a junior, and she literally had almost drowned the summer before she learned to swim. And to see how she reacted when she learned to swim and the confidence that she had was just amazing. We did a press conference. She was on TV talking about the importance of that, but the confidence in her learning to swim gave her the confidence to believe that she could accomplish anything she wanted in life. Part of that program is a scholars program as well, a college readiness program. And I can guarantee you, while she may not be an Olympic swimmer, she's going to be top of whatever field she tries 
to, you know, as a profession because of that confidence that she received just by learning to swim. And that, that touches my heart every time. You just said a magic word. Actually, a couple of questions have come in around this as well. Um, she, let's talk about the girls for a moment. There's some great women athletes out there doing some wonderful things. And we haven't had a chance to really talk about women in sports and, and the role they're playing also with their voices. I know what it was like to be in New York City when the women's soccer team had their parade and to sit in front of City Hall when they spoke. And, and I know that you know, I, I stood taller that day. So what about the girls? So gender equality is one of our core platform areas. And one of the things that we do is we have a Daughters of Greatness where women come in and they give speeches and they're generally in areas that have been dominated by men. And they set an example for women to follow. And as we all know, women rule the world. They're more than half the sky, basically, because it's more women than men in the world, more women than men in this country. So I think it's very important that we support women. Um, I happen to sit on the selection committee for ESPN Humanitarian Awards. And I read about what Maya Moore was doing in terms of criminal justice and trying to get a man who had been wrongly convicted free. And for her to have given up a year of her career to do that was just an amazing thing. And I think what the WNBA players are doing is amazing. So women's voices should be heard, should be respected, and should be listened to in the utmost way we can possibly do so. As a fellow judge with the SBN Humanitarian Award, I read that application the same way. <laughs> it totally moved me. It did. Yeah, I'd say that the women don't get enough respect, the women athletes, for what they're doing. Um, if you go back and think about this, the issues that we're talking about, and specifically when it comes to criminal justice reform and community policing, the WNBA protested as a league long before Colin Kaepernick even took a knee. And so to me, that speaks volumes. One, women are always running to the front to protect us. Um, I think they don't get enough credit for that. But two, the women themselves, like they've been selfless. You know, they aren't afraid to speak up. They've always been that way, uh, especially as of late, the athletes as of late. You know, obviously there's been a long journey and there's been a lot of bold women that'll continue to tear down barriers. But the women now, they know who they are and they stand firm in that. So when you watch the WBA, when you watch the women's soccer team, it's no surprise. I'm, I'm their biggest cheerleader because I'm like, hey, I, you're right. <laughs> you know, we need to acknowledge that because if there's anything wrong, they're one of the first in line. So to me, I, I don't think the women athletes get enough respect for what they're doing. And they've always been very consistent. It's just unfortunate that the media doesn't give them the attention that they give men players when it comes to actually being out in the community or literally in the streets, whatever it may be, or in the globally, right? There's a lot of women play across the globe in soccer and basketball as well. Um, they're making an impact all over and they just don't get the respect that they deserve. Yeah, I okay, I, I, yeah I, I couldn't <laughs> agree more. And, and I, to add to that, uh, you know, by, by my experience and, and, and reading some, some some books um, as well. Um, women in in in, uh, in a lot of countries, in most countries, are are viewed and perceived and acknowledged as as really true anchors, uh, as the drivers of their of uh, their homes, not just their homes but their countries. Uh, I read that the, this uh, the father of the microcredits, Mohammed Mohammed Yunus, uh, who won a Nobel Prize. Um, he, he's, uh, he's bank who gives microcredits to poor people. Um, the, the women are the ones that actually are more reliable. They're, that pay back those credits on a 98% basis. So basically he gives the credits, he gives the money to women because they will 
take care of it. They won't blow it. They'll take care of the children, their providers, their caregivers. In Africa, the woman, the woman, once again, the woman is the one that will never flee the house, will stay at home, will get, go through everything with their children. And is raising, they're raising five, whatever, whatever amount, five, 10 children by themselves. Uh, and and to me, the the figure of, of of women should be much more amplified, should be much more appreciated, acknowledged, respected, uh, listened to, and recognized. Uh, and uh, and as you, you guys said, some examples, WNBA have done a fantastic job just just speaking out. Uh, those those women are women are incredible, and I hope they continue to, to get the, the attention that they deserve. And we continue to listen to them. Uh, Megan, Megan Rapino is another example mm -hmm. of, a, of a woman that is, she's, she's just not afraid of anything. And she was inspired, I think, also by Colin Kaepernick. Uh, and she started also taking the knee during the anthems, during uh, the, the USA soccer games. And what she's doing now with HBO, you know, in, a, in her show and just, just having conversations, been doing her part, and she's a, an incredible and uh, incredible uh, human being. Um, so uh, I hope that we can see more and more of that, and we recognize it because these these women are are just uh, a, a true example for all of us. Well, let me just switch gears yeah. how while I have you on the screen and ask you, um, what are you hearing from your colleagues around the globe about what's going on in America right now? What are they sharing? What they think? Hmm. Well, it's, it's, it's hard to have an opinion of what goes on in a foreign country, right? You only, and everything, media at the end of the day dictate a lot of, of the information that you get, right? But what I will say is, at the end of the day, the United States, it's an example for any other country that pretty much in the world. Everyone looks up to the United States. So how things are handled here, how things are taken care of here. Uh, other countries will try to apply that in there because the, the issues that go on in the United States, um, you know, I, I don't think that they only happen here. Uh, there's many countries that go through the same thing. So um, obviously it's, uh, you know, it's a little messy. Uh, some people, uh, it's hard to believe certain things that, that are happening here and they're, that this country is being exposed um by but at the same time that's why again this country has a huge responsibility to the entire world to take care of these issues in a way that is exemplary um and and that's that's what we that's what we're in and that's what we we gotta also play our role so one of our viewers i think asked a, a really good question you know so we're so we're in the streets we're using our voices what's next what's the next step what do we need to do? Well, we've got to have a plan. We've got to have a plan and, and set specific goals. And as, as Donald was saying before, uh, as far as when voting goes and electing our people, whether it's locally, whether it's statewide, federally, uh, countrywide, we got to be, we got to hold ourselves accountable first uh, in order to make those, those decisions and then hold those people accountable for how they run things. Um, so uh, I think that that's, that's part of the plan and that's, we gotta talk about specific actions besides having conversation and voicing our feelings and opinions and learning. I'll say, okay, now what do we wanna accomplish? Um, and, 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 and pursue it and pursue it and don't stop until we get, until we get there. Yeah, I'd say to continue to educate yourself and, and then act. Um, too often, you know, you see people, they're in the streets, they're protesting, they're talking about things on social media, but there isn't enough action happening. So I think a lot of people complain about things, but don't necessarily take the next step and figure out what they can do. Because too often people look for Superman to come to save them, not realizing that they have a cape on their back. And so it's important for people to realize the power that they have individually and even the power that they have to gather people collectively to go out and to create the change that, you know, they want to see. You know, people don't even know what it means to hold your politicians' feet to the fire, right? People vote and then just leave, you know, like protest for a day and then just leave. You know, it's a process and, you know, there's this huge awakening in this country right now 
Um, we have to make sure that we continue to put to put that pressure there because we can't leave through this time period that we're in right now and have things operate the same way with the same expectations. We can't go to sleep at night saying that, hey, this is just the way it is. Like, no, we're the generation to help change that and we're the right people for the job. Well said. You know, I, I, I've heard a lot of people talking about what's going on now with, with various levels of optimism and pessimism. And the comment that I keep saying to them is the last time we saw a lot of change in this country was after we saw people in the streets. Well, there are people in the streets and there is a spotlight. You know, these are not new problems. There's just a brighter light on them right now. So the window's open and here's the chance. And a number of our audience is dealing with young athletes. And so the questions I, I, I guess I would ask all three of you now would be, you know, what's the sphere of influence, first of all, you think an athlete has that others don't? And then to a young athlete, they're going to sign off at the end of our program today. What can they do? You know, we, we talked about they could call one of you, they could get some advice, but what's a tangible action? Give them a tangible action. I guess, I guess what I would say is just to, to, to reach out, uh, you know, to find out how you can get in touch with, uh, with so-and-so, with whoever you want to talk to in whichever way. And I think by us being here, our doors are open. You know, our hearts are in the right place and we got to walk the walk. Uh, so, so I would say, uh, you know, just, just be, be proactive, take action, you know, follow up with what you want to accomplish what uh, what's important to you, the story said earlier. Uh, you know, see how you can do your part or what role you can play. Um, so I think that that's, you know, uh, I think whether it's through an email, through an agency, through the the players association, through whatever it might be, just 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 uh, you know, find a way, find a way. There is a way. Uh, you just got to find it, or and, and try multiple ways. You know, if one doesn't work, go to the next one just to be relentless, just as you are on a football field, on a basketball court, or whatever field you play in. Okay. If I can answer that too, I wanna to piggyback on something Paul and Bo Tori say, learn as much as you can about the history, your history, because we have been fighting the same fight for over 400 years in this country. And if you understand the history and you understand the incremental steps that we've taken and then they've gotten pushed back, you can ask a Powell and you can ask a Tory the right questions and they can give you the direction that you need to head in because it's asking about the history that's going to help you develop your passion. And if you have passion, then you can really, really make a difference. Yeah, I'd add it it wasn't just aimed towards the young professional athletes or college athletes uh, to the high schoolers with their sitting next to their mom's laptop on uh, Facebook. Um, you know, it's important to know that it starts at home mm. and it starts, it starts with you. So, you know, ask questions in your family first, you know, we, we know what's right and what's wrong, uh, whether it's something that you're hearing or something that's actually happening. So have those conversations with your family first, then try to learn about what's going on in your school, in your town. Those are places where you are, right? We can't continue to, to keep acting like certain things don't exist in certain areas, right? Like it's, it's been way too long. You know, there's literally places and towns where, you know, there's streets where it's known, hey, on this side of the street, it's like this. And on this side of the street, it is split this way. That is the norm across so many cities in this country. And so, we can't continue to allow our kids to grow up and then act like they, these things aren't, don't exist or that's not important. So I think the way we communicate as parents to our children, but also as kids as well, like the way you communicate with your friends, what's allowed around you. The conversations that are allowed around you says a lot about who you are, you know, because if people are comfortable having certain conversations with you, then that means they think you believe or you fit in with what they believe if it's wrong. So it's important to just start with yourself, start with your home, and then continue to educate yourself and you'll find something that you're passionate about because there are so many wrongs in our society and you have to believe that you are the right person for the job. 
you know, Tori, you touched on something that's very near and dear to me personally, and that is, you know, the influence we, we do get from very, very early on in our lives. And as parents, you know, and, and Pal, as the new parent, I would say this to you, you know, the subtle messages you send are as important as the big ones. Um, you know, when I used to do this work for a living and I would ask a room full of people, you know, yell out the answer, the moon is made of, and inevitably they would yell out cheese or green cheese or blue cheese, depending where in the country you were, and which I someday I'll figure out that too. But now we all know as adults, the moon isn't made of cheese, but as very little children, someone told us that. And it tickled our fancy enough that it stays with you as an adult in a training program in a corporate America. When I ask you the moon is made of, you say cheese. And that tells you the power of the messages we hear as very, very little children and how important it is for us as parents to consciously, consciously ensure that we're giving some of the appropriate messages. You're right about the conversations we have and the messages it tells. So, you know, and I think that spans across, you know, all of us as people, all of us as parents, and all of you as athletes in particular, because your conversations become public. Your words become public. What you say, how you say it, who you say it to, when you say it, becomes part of the legacy that you leave behind and the influence and the span that you, that you stretch. So um, I'm getting ready to wrap us up. So let me do, give you each one last say, last message of what you'd like to say. And Don, Donald, we'll start with you. And I apologize because I three times I've done it to you. Donald, go ahead. I just wanted to give a message of hope and say that what I've seen here in the streets in Louisville, that the community is coming together, black, brown, white, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, they're all coming together. And I think when people come together and they protest together and they have the same idea in mind that, and they're taking the, the right action that we can change the course of this country. And I think that's very important. And it's, it's a beautiful thing to see. And I just hope it keeps up. From your mouth. <laughs> How? Uh, what, I, what I would say, it's, uh, I think, um, you know, it's a lot of things that we touched on on the, on the conversation, but I think we, we, I believe that we have a, uh, an unparalleled opportunity in our hands, in front of us, um, and, and it's on us and up to us to, to make things better. Uh, and, and it will only happen by coming together, as Donald was saying, and what's happening in Kentucky. It doesn't matter. We, we all have to want a better world, a better country, a better reality for, for not just for ourselves, but for everyone, for our children, for the future. We, we have a responsibility. And, um, and just, and again, we got to take action. It's uh, conversations are important. Education is critical. Read about, read about history, read about what's been happening. I think that empowers you to have deeper conversations. Um, and, and I would just encourage everyone to, to do that uh, and, and to continue to take action little by little, step by step, getting closer to, to a better place. Sorry. Um, I'd say where there's a complaint, there's a solution. And you have to believe that you can find it and you may be the person to solve it. And, you know, there's no such thing as a, a dumb question when it comes to the things that we're talking about here, because sometimes you don't know what you don't know. So don't be afraid to have uncomfortable conversations. You know, I tell people all the time, I'm, there's not a conversation that's uncomfortable to me because a lot of things that people are talking about is my reality. So how am I com uncomfortable talking about myself the things, a problem that I'm dealing with? And so I think it's important for us to realize that, um, be bold in conversations, don't allow certain things to happen around you. Um, again, I think that's something that it, it means a lot now because it starts at home. Because so many people are looking for the big fix right now. Like, okay, we're, I'm gonna do this, you know, I'm gonna put this sign in my yard. I'm gonna make this statement publicly. I'm gonna put this, you know, this memo out, right? Like, no, like it starts with you individually and who knows what that can snowball into, but at the end of the day, it's gonna take everyone together to do it and uh, just trust the process and just know that if we all continue to push in the same, of, of same direction, eventually the tide will turn. You know, all three of you have affiliations with uh, foundations, obviously, 
Donald is directing the Muhammad Ali Foundation, Paul with the Gasol Foundation, Corey with your foundation. I wanna make sure our viewers are fully versed and aware of all three foundations and encourage all the viewers to you know, go online, read about what all three of these gentlemen are doing because it is just amazing. I, I, I will wrap us up with one little last story before I turn this back to Sven and, and, and thank Joanne, thank Sven, thank Harvard for, for participating, thank all of you know, the very many people, Lee LaRosa who participated in putting this together. Um, you know, that when I used to work in the space of diversity, there was a story that I learned from a woman, Ellen Bett, and I don't know where she got it from, but of two people walking down the street and it's rush hour in New York and it's really loud. There are thousands of people, it's pre-COVID, thousands of people in the streets and the buses are going by, the trains are whizzing by, the horns are honking, the taxis are yelling. And all of a sudden, one of the women turns to the other woman and she says, did you hear that? I think I just heard a wren. And the woman, the other woman looks at her like, what are you crazy? How could you possibly hear a wren? There's traffic, there's noise, there's horns, there's yelling, there's screaming. And she says to her, how could you have heard a wren? And instead of answering the question, the first woman reaches in her pocket and she pulls out a handful of change and she throws it up in the air and the change scatters on the sidewalk and all of a sudden people stop and they're all picking up the change. And she said, you see, you hear what you listen for. Well, I think in today's world, we gotta start listening to all that we hear, not just hearing what we listen for. All three of you just gave us such beautiful words of wisdom. I think all three are such fine examples of using your podium, not just for yourselves, but for good. And I am really honored to have had the privilege to launch this with all three of you. So I thank you all so very much for your time, for your energy, but mostly for your passion and your humanity. And I feel very lucky to have been here with all three of you today. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Sven. Thank you so much, Kara. And thank you so much for facilitating what was, I think, a beautiful and insightful discussion, uh, kind of the beginning of something that uh, we hope is going to be much bigger in the future. And it was such a rich conversation. I think what I took away from Tori was the sense of, you know, you, we need to speak out, we need to act. And sometimes we need to act not just globally or nationally, but we need to act on a very local level. And from power, I took away this urgent sense of responsibility that, that all of us, I mean, some of us are more privileged to be able to speak to larger audiences than others. Some of us are more able to do things, but we all have a responsibility to take part in shaping our future. And, uh, and you know, we have, all of us have a certain ability to, to, to make a difference in, 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 in the world. And, and, and your words, power, I think were beautiful in encouraging us to think in this way. And then Donald, I really appreciate your emphasis on history. Of course, I'm a historian. That's what I do for a living. Uh, and of course, I have to agree with you. But I think it's not just because, I've, I, because I'm a historian that I have to agree with you. But, but, but I think you know, people have gone through troubles in the past. They have tried to make a difference in the world. They have sometimes encountered truly hopeless situations. And they have still decided to speak out. They still have, have decided to put their lives on the line. And sometimes they did make a difference. And to remember both the terrible parts of this history, but also the inspiring parts of the history is, is really important at this contemporary moment when often or all too often people have lost the sense of hope. So, so I think this is, uh, this is uh, in, important to think back uh, to, to, to our past and, and, to, to, and to learn from that 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 past, the terrible parts of it, but but also the inspiring parts of it. Um, so I hope this was just the beginning of what is going to be a much longer conversation. It actually reminded me very much, all of you reminded me so much of when John Lewis said, you know, what we need to do is we need to raise good trouble, we need to raise necessary trouble. You seem to be all on board with that. Uh, and, and I very much agree. So, so let's make that just the beginning of, of, of a long and, uh, and, and important conversation. Uh, our next conversation will be on October 22nd, Thursday, October 22nd. And at that time, we will be focusing a little bit more specifically on the history, the meaning and the current dilemmas of voting. Uh, it will be a very um, timely topic on October 22nd. And uh, we very much hope that you all are going to be able to join us for this meeting. 
And then also we hope that you're going to visit us on our various social media outlets, athletic, athletesvoices.org, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and or Athletes Vox on Instagram, uh, where you will find uh, more information of what it is we are doing and also more program updates. Uh, we are very grateful for all of your participation today and we look forward to our journey ahead and on behalf of the Global Sports Initiative at the Weather Initiative on Global History and Athletes Voices, I want to thank you for being with us today. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.